Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry for just a bit of a delayed start. Um, working out a couple of technical details as we get going, but um, we're all set now and looking forward to a great session together. Um, welcome. This is our third and final session in our Education Connections webinar series on supporting newcomer English learners. My name is Lindsay Massoud, and I'm here with Ann Hangerer and some others from our team. You can see a pic of the whole team on Twitter if you log on. Um, we are here with Anne again, an expert in ESL methods and teacher professional development. Um, we are delighted that she's here with us again to share about supporting newcomer students. A warm welcome to all of you who have been able to join us. This is our 23rd Education Connections webinar. Welcome to the webinar. We'll begin today with a brief introduction, and then we'll hear from Anne about supporting newcomer English learners. She'll focus on understanding and creating social-emotional supports for newcomer students, and she'll also provide some practical suggestions for facilitating student-to-student -student interaction. We'll reserve some time at the end for questions and answers. Um, so we hope that you'll submit some questions throughout the presentation. We'll be watching for those as they come in, and we encourage you to send along any thoughts that you have, um, and Anne will respond to as many as she can um, at the end of her presentation. We'll also be doing a couple of polls as we get going, so we'll show you those results as they come in as well. We also invite you to chat with us further about the topic by joining us on Twitter. You can follow us at EdConnectCal and use the hashtag EdConnects, E-D-C-O-N-X, to participate in the conversation with us and your fellow educators. For those of you who are new to Education Connections, um, we are an online community of teachers working together to implement standards-based instruction. We have a variety of ways for teachers to participate. We have lots of resources. We post all of these live events or webinars there, so you can look at our past sessions as well. You can access all of them, the video, um, as well as PDFs of the PowerPoints there. Um, and as a reminder, we will post the video archive from today's session and a PDF of the PowerPoint in the Education Connections website, which you see there. So on your screen now, we'll show a few polling questions regarding your background. We love to find out who is with us. So can you check um, what is your current position? General education teacher, instructional coach or teacher educator? ELL, ESOL, or bilingual teacher, ELL, ESOL, or bilingual coordinator or administrator, or some other position. All right, so we have a number of mystery folks on the line today, um, but we do have quite a number of, uh, of you are working directly with um, English learners in either capacity as a teacher or a coordinator or administrator. So it's great to know. And then we have a few instructional coaches and teacher educators as well. Fantastic. So you can help to spread, spread this knowledge to, to your colleagues as well. Great. Okay, so now we want to find out um, what grade levels you primarily work with. Or do you work with pre-K to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 12, across the pre-K 12 spectrum, or with college or university students? All right, so we have a lot of you working in elementary or across pre-K-12, and then a number of you in high school, a few of you in middle school, um, and a few of you in college as well. Um, that uh, mirrors what we saw last time, so thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thanks for being here. All right, so we also wanted to find out what areas of the country um, do we have represented today. All right, so it looks like, similar to last time, we have a lot of people from the Northeast, about half of you, and then distributed across the Midwest, South, and West, and then a few of you outside the United States. So thank you very much for calling in today. We're glad you're here. 
All right, finally, we were curious um, who um, attending today has attended the other two sessions. So as I said, this is the third session um, in this series on newcomer students, and we were interested in hearing if you all have been to the other sessions or if this is your first one. Okay, great. So it looks like for a number of you, this is your first webinar in this series. And as I mentioned, we have the videos and the PowerPoints from those previous sessions hosted on Education Connections. So uh, you're welcome to log on there. Um, you do have to create an account, but it's free and there's no obligations or anything. It's just resources for you. So feel free to log on there and you can access those other webinars as well if you want a little bit of more information after today's session. So I will now turn it over to Anne. Anne, thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to hear, hearing from you. Thank you so much. And I want to welcome back those of you who have attended session one and two. And a very warm welcome to those of you who are new to our sessions. Today is the third and final webinar in supporting English learner newcomers. And as I have done in the past, I'm going to present two sets of objectives. I will present content objectives and language objectives. So in today's content objectives, they're going to tell us what we hope to cover. At the end of the session, participants will be able to, one, recognize four particular examples of social emotional supports for newcomer students. Two, identify ways of providing social emotional supports for newcomers. And three, analyze strategies for, for facilitating student to student interaction among newcomer students. In our language objectives, we will discuss how we will use the four language skills, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, to cover what we hope to do today. First, we will orally discuss four types of social emotional supports. Second, we will list specific examples of how to provide social emotional supports for newcomer students. And finally, third, we will record strategies for facilitating student to student interaction among newcomer students. During our first webinar, we discussed the importance of knowing and understanding our newcomers' stories. In the last session, we talked about both trauma and culture shock and how that can affect a student's behavior in school. Today, we will continue on a related topic, looking at the importance of including social, economic, emotional supports for newcomers. To begin today's content, we will look closely and quickly at one student's description of her journey to America Please follow as I read. The suitcase closed and I went blind. My body was squeezing under suitcases. I felt depressed and hot. I just wanted to escape, but many suitcases were stacked on me. I was sweating. I wanted to scream, but I knew that it would be worst. They could go after my sweet grandma and hurt her because she was sending me to freedom. I could get beat up or killed. I knew I would never get to see my single dad. I would never achieve what my mom's hope and my grandma's hope. So I made my hands fist and breathe strongly. So why are social emotional supports so important for our newcomers? First of all, research tells us positive emotional well-being correlates with higher academic engagement, a sense of belonging and connectedness in school, and in academic motivation. Furthermore, evidence suggests that integrating social emotional competencies into academics enhances student learning. As we discussed in depth in our previous webinar, newcomers often leave behind the established support networks they've, they've had in their own country, their family, their friends, their school, their houses of worship. 
they also face a range of stressors that can be different from those that non-newcomers face. These stressors might include acculturation, feelings of being forced to choose between the home culture and the new culture, sociocultural alienation, loss of support, bullying and discrimination based on their perceived race, ethnicity, national origin, or religion. In addition, all of this in addition to having to learn a new language. In the next slides, we will look at some different formal and informal ways to provide social emotional support networks to our newcomers, things that we in our schools can do to help these students and their families. Hang on, everybody. We're just having a quick mic problem. We're fixing it. We'll be right back with you. Okay, before we lost before we lost our connection, we were talking about fostering a supportive environment for our newcomers. And the things that we can make an effort to do is to learn about our newcomers so that we can work with them effectively. It helps if we know about their culture, about their family, and about their backgrounds. And it's also important to know that everyone within the school settings plays an important role in providing social emotional support to refugee students and their families. That includes the teachers, the administrators in the school, the counselors, the social service providers, and those organizations from outside the school, the churches and other sponsoring organizations that can help these newcomers and their families acculturate. In 2016, the U.S. Department of Education published a pamphlet called um, the Newcomer Toolkit. And in that toolkit, they identified actually four types of emotional supports. And they divided these supports into a formal category and an informal category. Let's look first at the formal category, the adult-led formal category of providing social emotional support. These would be such things as establishing strategic collaborations with culturally relevant community or faith-based organizations or institutions, such things as formal extended day programs in schools, clubs, sports, opportunities for service learning, allow students to learn in an interactive, interest-driven environments, and providing support for parents and families in their home language on topics, topics such as college planning, tax preparation, immigration assistance, medical, dental, or mental health clinics, and computer and internet skills. The benefits of such formal programs are multi there are multiple benefits, and I'm going to mention three here. First, these supports offer a sense of stability and help minimize the fear of acculturation. They also help students focus their efforts in order to achieve success. And finally, they offer consistent communication to help strengthen relations among families, students, schools, and their new community. Um, Adult-led supports can also be on an informal basis. In many of our schools, we have advisory programs or advisory groups, and students might meet with their advisor on a daily basis 
or a weekly basis, but there's time built into the schedule for advisory meetings. And there's times for students to check in with school counselors. And the benefits of these are they offer regular and consistent support for the students. They provide opportunities for one-on-one -on -one informal and confidential environments and establish a feeling of reciprocal trust. Let's examine now the peer base, the, the formal uh, supports that they put in place for the peers. Our, the peers can help the students as much as the adults. These are things such as cross-age peer mentoring between students of different ages, or cross-age programs such as tutoring, sports assistance, junior counselors. Benefits of these programs help both these students and their mentors, and both peers and mentors learn through their relationships. And if you remember from our first seminar, we saw the um, collaboration between between the middle school students and the high school students as they learned about one another um, in the newcomers high school in Queens. It also helps students gain independence, understand and respect diverse people and experiences, and move towards functioning effectively. Let's look now at the informal peer-based programs. This this informal pr uh, process allows students, newcomers, the opportunities to speak in informal social situations, which are much less stressful, give students the opportunity to have access to linguistic support, opportunity to interact with others from the same cultural background. And the benefits here allow the students to assume the leadership role, very often our newcomers and our English learners do not have a role of leadership, and here they can, and encourage positive interethnic interactions to support English proficiency and academic achievement. In the chat box, we would like you to share some examples of social and emotional supports that you have used, that you have seen used in your schools, um, and they can be either formal or informal adult-led, or formal or informal peer-based. And we're going to share these with you as they come in so that we can learn from one another and what each of you is doing successfully in your school setting. It looks like one school has an intervention specialist. It's awesome. Uh, somebody offers an after-school study group with free transportation and a snack provided. It's informal and adult-led. Another school system had instituted an advisory system last year. There was new student orientation for ESL students at a university. Somebody has partnered with refugee students, partnered refugee students with American students at lunch at high school level, and this fostered friendships. Someone else hosted a parent leadership council meeting for ESL parents led by students and teachers, and I think that is awesome that students were involved in leading that session. Somebody set up a a kind of reading buddy type program where the newcomers could come and read to one another. Um, once their language progressed, they were then able to start reading in English to the other students. One elementary school offered lunch bunches that they were organized by the teachers and often as a reward, reward but served to bring together a few students during the lunch time to develop closer friendships. Transportation for students to go shopping on a weekly basis. Wow. 
intentional scheduling for newcomers to pair with same language peers, informal and peer-based. Somebody started a soft landing newcomer program. Students only stay as long as they need to. I, I like that idea of it being a, a soft rollout. Uh, international services at the university students have hosted several professional day workshops, advisory periods, clubs, reconnecting youth, uh, mentoring, restorative justice, ESL parent meetings, cultural showcases where students were share culture with the mainstream students. There was an international club and, and an international night, including a Know Your Rights night for, for parents. What a great idea. Uh, adjustment of counseling and bilingual courses. Elementary level English classes for parents where they learn strategies to read with their child at home. What a wonderful way to bring families in and allow the families to support their, their children at home. What great ideas. Okay. Now I'd like to introduce you to two newcomers. Um, and we're going to take a look at their stories. And we're going to look at some possible social or emotional supports that could be put in place for them and allow you to weigh, on, weigh in on what you think might be helpful for them. We're going to meet Ariette, who's a Somalian who lived in a refugee camp in Kenya before coming to the United States. And then we will meet Ming, who immigrated from China a few months ago. And together we're going to identify some appropriate ways that we can support the specialized needs of these two students. Okay, let's meet Ariette first. Ariette is an 11-year-old newcomer from Kenya. However, Ariette is not originally from Kenya. Her family is from Somalia. For the past two years, Ariette has lived with her family in a series of refugee camps along the Kenyan border. Uh, the camp also had refugees from Ethiopia and South Sudan. Ariette had some schooling in the refugee camps, but often the grades were mixed and the schools were temporary structures without electricity or water. There, Ariette learned many jump rope songs in Swahili, which she loves to sing at recess in her new school in the United States. In class, however, Ariette never speaks, and she usually sits with her head down. Okay, let's look at some of these ideas that we could, that could be used. Some of these are formal, some of them are informal. I'm going to read through them, and when I'm finished, I'm going to ask all of you to pick Hang on everyone, coming right back. We have a little bit of a funky mic today, but we're, <laughs> we're getting it back to you, so we'll be back with you in just one minute. So sorry for the issues. As with anything in education, there always has to be a plan B. So this is our plan B. Um, I've switched microphones, and I hope you can hear me now. Um, we had a chance to read through the story of Ariette, who, while she 
participates in, research, in recess at her school by singing some Swahili jump rope songs that she learned in Kenya, she, in class, is really unresponsive, quiet, and sits with her head down. So we're going to read through possible formal or informal supports, social and emotional supports for her. And after we do so, we're going to ask you to weigh in by giving two or three or four ideas of what you think might help her adjust to school better. And by all means, feel free to add your own suggestions. These Our suggestions are just that, suggestions. But there's the cross-age peer mentoring, youth leadership program, social services referral, like housing and health services, a family coordinator who engages with the family, an after-school enrichment activity, after-school athletics, student support teams, advisory programs, family programs hosted at the school, group counseling, a summer bridge program, a, a summer school program that would uh, support her into the next year of school, informal caring from school staff. These are just suggestions, and please now if you could type in two or three supports that you think might be appropriate for Ariette. I think that after school enrichment activity and cross-age mentoring would be appropriate. It sounds like uh, we had some of these, some interrupted formal education and she could use some help in, um, in her learning and perhaps a bridge program would hurt for her or would help for her. Um, let's see, uh, a family program hosted at the school would bring in her family as well, group counseling, student support teams, uh, after-school enrichment, cross-age peer mentoring, uh, the summer bridge program, and after-school programs. And I think you're right. I think all of these would support her, would give her more individualized attention and allow her to thrive and hopefully start to participate in our classes. Okay, let's meet Ming, who is a high school student. Ming is an 11th grader um, in a diverse urban school. He attended a local school in China before immigrating with his family to the United States just a few months ago. Ming excelled academically in China but he is finding it difficult to keep up with his classes in this new school because he is struggling with English. He knows that in a few months his classmates will be taking the SAT and ACT tests and several of his new friends are discussing the colleges they hope to attend. Many students are driving to school, dating or going to parties and volunteering in the community. However, Ming feels left behind and confused. So once again, we're going to read through some supports. And again, I'm going to ask you to pick out one, two, or three that you think would be helpful to Ming, who's a different age and has different needs than Ariette. Cross-age peer mentoring, a youth leadership program, social services referral, family coordinator who engages with his family, an after-school enrichment activity, after-school athletics, student support teams, an advisory program, family programs hosted at the school, group counseling, a summer bridge program, remember he's in 11th grade now, about to enter the 12th, or informal caring from the school staff. We'll give you just a minute to weigh in on what you think might be helpful, which supports, social or emotional supports would be helpful to Ming. Somebody suggested peer mentoring for Ming, a family coordinator, 
an after-school enrichment activity, a st student support teams, athletics, t sports are a great way to bring students into the school community and to get involved. All the activities on the list, somebody said, youth leadership, um, family programs, informal caring, uh, a caring staff, doesn't that have a lot to do with it? Yes. Um, an after-school activity where he can meet other peers, youth leadership program to build confidence, an advisory program where they can discuss these topics informally, and I think that is the key, much less threatening to discuss these things informally than in a formal setting and supports from within the Chinese community in his area. Those are all great suggestions. Thank you very much for those. And we would like to refer you to this U.S. Department of Education Newcomer Toolkit. And on the slide, you can see the website where you can access information about this toolkit. It was just recently published in 2016, so it has all of the latest information. Oh, one thing I wanted to add, somebody just added um, what I think is a really good suggestion for Ming is hearing other students' stories and their experiences as well, so he may not feel so alone and lost. Okay. All right, now let's talk about ways that we can actually involve our newcomers in the classroom, in inclusive classroom activities. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I think I'm going to give you a chance to do this. There's um, an opportunity for you to list. Many of you echoed what we suggested. I would love to hear from you if there's any other social emotional supports that you have used or are, that are available at your school. Because once again, we're here to, we're a community of learners and we're here to learn from one another. So go ahead and share those thoughts in the question box. I'll share them aloud as they come in, and then we'll move on to the next part of the webinar. Oh, this is great. Um, Trauma-sensitive schools has some great tools. Doorway check-ins, community, I can't read it, see, community. Oh, community meetings and power plans. So that's a great tool for all of us to access. Somebody else here mentioned um, the usage of parents as community leaders and how to address the socio-emotional. Bring the parents in. Many of these parents, they themselves have gone through the same trauma that their, their children are going through. Um, somebody started a connections program trying to keep the students from dropping out of school. So, so often students of Ming's age give up and they drop out. Um, they have ranger buddies, um, is a ranger bear uh, or a mascot, and the adults in the building commit to building a closer relationship with one student, and they have lunch together, an adult buddy passes on good books to read or finds resources to support the students. Uh, there's a college tour with a partnership with international support from, from Communi often community colleges will invite these students to come and visit, so they, it's not such a mystery. They aid them in the application process, which is foreign to so many students and their families. Uh, there's trauma-sensitive uh, research, and later on we will post, we will post um, the link to that. Thank you very much for supplying that.
Okay. Thank you very much. And now let's move on to the meat of the matter. And how can we think back to Ariette, who sits in our classroom. She doesn't say a word. And most often, her head is down. And the one way that we can help our newcomers participate in the classroom is by featuring interactive activities, activities, learner activities that require the students to interact with one another. It takes the stress off of Ariette. She's not alone. She's going to be working collaboratively with other students. And so I'd like to talk first about why interaction is important and then to give you some suggested learning activities, many of which I know you are already using. And in the end, I would like to hear about what, is, what it is that you've used in your class to have your students interact with one another. Student-to-student -student interaction is extremely important for several reasons. But first of all, it emphasizes the importance of linguistic turn uh, taking between teacher and students and among students. It provides all students with the opportunity to use academic language. And it encourages elaborated responses about lesson concepts. And very often in an interactive activity, if it's structured carefully in such a way so that there's scaffolds for newcomers, um, there are no passes for students. Students have to participate, even if it's on a very limited basis. And so they will be drawn in and begin to take a more active part in the class. What does interaction look like? Well, interaction actually has two faces. It's teacher talking with students. But I want to emphasize that we need to limit our teacher talk. I think we all talk too much. I was guilty of that. And most importantly, it's students talking with students about the content that they're learning. So how do we encourage? interaction and participation in the classroom, we have to do so by structuring our learner activities so that the students need to interact with each other. Students are not going to be doing individualized uh, exercise sheets or answering questions individually. They're going to be working collaboratively to do uh, activities so that they, as they learn the new content concepts. And what we have here are just some suggestions of things that have worked. I'm going to go through each of them and explain how they work. And then I am most, I know that many of you use these, um, but I'm most particularly interested in hearing from you and what you use that works for interaction in your classroom. Let's start with the vocabulary spinner. For those of us who have a smart board, we are lucky because we can post this on the smart board, and the smart board will even have a tool to spin for us. But that doesn't mean we have to do it that way. We can create a paper version of a spinner such as this. It doesn't. This one has eight different parts. It could have as few as four. But what happens is the teacher gives the students a word. Let's take the word, for example, cold. And they work collaboratively either in partners, but even better in a table group of four, to answer what comes up on the spinner. So let's imagine we, the spinner has just stopped on the part that says draw it. So the word is cold. This gives us a great scaffold for our English learners. They might draw a thermometer with 32 degrees and lower, or they might draw the picture of someone shivering, perhaps. It, it uh, will spin the next time, and the students will have to act it out. So they work collaboratively. The four of them work together to act out what cold is going to look like. Or perhaps it might spin again, and they would have to use it in a sentence. But the important thing is the students are not doing this individually, but they're doing this collaboratively. So even the newcomer is able to follow. He has someone to model in the group. And he or she could do, for example, the drawing part or the acting it out, perhaps. OK. Um, research tells us that students by the end of middle school have to have a reading vocabulary of 25,000 words. And by the end of high school, that number reaches 
50,000 words. And so we know that our newcomer and our, all of our English learners are way behind when it comes to vocabulary acquisition. So we have to give them the tools to help them catch up. And one way to do it is by, first of all, teaching them root words and affixes, common root words and common affixes in English, and then allowing them to work together to play a game by combining prefixes, root words, and suffixes, getting points for their table group, and creating new words. So let's just take the example on this slide. The students have been taught that re means again. So once they know that, look at the number of, they have eight more words at their disposal. They can redraw, remove, rethink, they're going to think again, replay, play again, retell, and so forth. So the way this game would work is somewhere in the room, the teacher has posted, and this could even be at the table groups, the most common a list of the common prefixes. So every time the student sees un, like undo, they know it means not or the opposite. Or if they see pre, it's going to mean before. In addition, the teacher will post, or at the desks, they will have the list of common suffixes. Like Every time they see S, that's a plural. Or every time they see ED, that might mean past tense. Or if they see the suffix full, it means full of. Or est means the most. And then they see a list of the common root words. Audi, spect, graph. And below these root words are written the common definitions. Every time they see hydro, they're going to know that water is involved. Meter is going to involve something to do with measure. Scribe or script has to do with writing, and so on. So at the table group, the students will be given a set of cards. Um, and we'll see these. Let's go to the next slide. And so this is just random. One table group has received three prefixes, un, miss, and re, six root words, and four suffixes, and well, actually a total of seven suffixes. And it is the jobs of the students collaboratively to combine prefixes and root words, root words and suffixes, or prefixes, root words, and suffixes to create new words and gain points. So let's say, for example, they see that miss can be combined with spell to form the new word misspell. That's a prefix and a root word, and for that they would gain one point. Or they might take the word spell and add an ing to it. Spelling, that is a root word and a suffix. That would be an additional point. But if the group can come up with all three, a prefix, a root word, and a suffix, like misspelling, they will get two points. And the students are given a time, say maybe they're given five minutes to do this, and they work together to get as many words as they can and try to earn as many points as they can. It becomes extremely competitive. The kids love it. And the teacher has a choice of actually giving every table the same group of prefixes, root words, and suffixes, and then they can compare their answers, or each table group could get um, an appropriately scaffolded group of words that might be easier for some and more challenging for your uh, higher flyer students. And that's called the word changer game. Um, another nice way of involving students, particularly in a reading, it's can be it's often called text charting, but we're going to do it this time by using a die. And the students will be given a short passage to read. Let's say they are reading a, um, a passage about Rosa Parks. And as they read, they're going to work in pairs. And they're going to work together to try to generate questions using who, what, where, when, why, or how. 
as they read. And they'll use sticky notes and they can, or they can annotate their passage. And then they will have prepared questions for each one of these categories. And then they're going to sit, they're going to square their pair, sit with a table group, and they're going to roll a die. So let's say, for example, the die, it's my turn and I roll a two, which means I have to ask a what question. So I might ask, what did Rosa Parks do that made her famous? And then I pass the die to my the next pay, uh, person at the table, and that person rolls a five. So he or she knows she has to ask a why question. Why was Rosa Parks famous? Why did Rosa Parks refuse to give up her seat on the bus? And so on. So they have been able to read through the lens of these six different questions, and they are able to access the reading in a more in a more meaningful way. And the fact that they're doing this collaboratively is much better than if they were to do it individually, where some students could do it very facilely and others couldn't do it at all. Um, a variation of this is called text charting. Um, that's the next one, Joy. Uh, and that is where you're using the same questions, who, what, where, when, how. But you can also include higher order thinking, like have them identify a problem, a conflict, a resolution, the cause and effect. So it's at a little bit higher level than just the who, what, where, when, how questions. And once again, the newcomers might be given the lower order questions, the who, what, when, where, how. And some of your more proficient students might be given the deeper questions. What was the problem? What was Rosa Parks' problem? What was the resolution of this problem? So both of these are a way to read in a directed manner and to collaborate with a buddy to do so. Um, this is one that is particularly well scaffolded to English learners, and it is called Stop and Write, or for the English learner, we could call it Stop and Draw. And in this case, the students will take it just a piece of paper, and they'll fold it like you would fold a legal, a legal letter, so that they have three columns. And let's, these are divided into two different ways. You can do it for fiction and nonfiction reading. So let's look at next at the fiction graphic. So here we are actually concentrating on two skills. What happened, which is a summary, and what will happen next, which is a prediction. Both skills are extremely difficult for all students, but most particularly for the English learners. And then they have a chance to go back to see if they were right. So if they're reading Cinderella, and the stepmother and the stepsisters have just left for the ball. What happened? Well, Cinderella was left behind. What will happen next? They have a chance to predict, oh, she'll be sad or she'll be able to, some way she'll get a chance to participate, and then they can check if they were right or wrong. Uh, some students would be able to write the answers. Others could just simply draw, or if they could write in their first language, that's perfectly acceptable as well because they're participating in the activity. The one for fi nonfiction looks a little bit different. It is, um, you'll see this time the first column says, what did we learn? The second column, what will we learn? It's a prediction. And were we right or not? So once again about Rosa Parks, she doesn't give up her seat. What happened? She refused to give up her seat and what will what will we learn? Well, we're going to learn what happened to her, and were we right or wrong in our prediction? Okay. Um, the inside-outside circle, I'm sure many of you use this. This is an activity that allows students to practice language multiple times within a very short period. So you, have, you organize your class into two groups of equal size. The outside circle faces in, and the inside circle faces out. The students are given a prompt or a question, and they take turns responding to the prompt or answering the question. And they can learn from one another. Perhaps the person in the outside circle had a completely different 
answer than I did on the inside circle, and I can incorporate his or her answer into my response. Then the either the inside circle or the outside circle takes one step clockwise, and students are paired with a new partner, and they do the same prompt again. This time, they should be more proficient at it. The English learner has heard it modeled. Um, the newcomer might even have had a chance to speak with somebody who is more fluency than he or she and will be able to repeat that answer. And this can be done several times until you decide that the activity is over. Uh, numbered heads together is a Kagan um, cooperative learning strategy. This allows students to work first individually, then collaboratively, but there is accountability to their um, work. So each student is given a prompt and allowed to answer individually. Then they put their heads together and share their answers. Let's say there's four at the table group. If this is the case, they will number off from one to four, and then you as the teacher will say, oh, would all the number ones please stand up? And in this case, they are going to have to, the number ones are going to have to either repeat what was said at the table, or you can direct your questions. Um, for the newcomer particularly, you can give them the opportunity to repeat either what they wrote or what somebody else at the table group said. So there's individual participation, collaboration, and most importantly, accountability. They have to listen to each other and discuss their responses. And our final activity is called a word splash, where you, once again, this is played as a table group. You have words splashed on the smart board or on the whiteboard. One word is removed. Say, for example, I remove the word factor. And the first table group that can identify the removed word has gets one point and has a chance to earn more points. They earn additional points by defining what a factor is, giving an example of a factor, and using the word factor in a sentence. Spelling it, defining it, using it in an original sentence. Okay. Um, before we weigh in and hear your ideas, I'd like to see if we've met our objectives for today. I always like to cycle back to see if we did what we said we were going to do. Uh, our content objectives. Did you recognize that there are four particular examples of social and emotional supports? Could you identify ways of providing social emotional supports for newcomer students? And would you be able to analyze strategies for facilitating student to student interaction among newcomer students? I hope you can. And let's look at linguistically how we were, will have accomplished that. Did we orally discuss four types of social and emotional supports? Did we list specific examples of how to provide social and emotional supports for newcomer students? And did we record strategies for facilitating student to student interaction among newcomer students? I want to thank you so much. And in the time that remains, I encourage you either to share interactive activities that you have used, and I'll read those out, or if you have any questions, um, I encourage you to ask those as well. Uh, somebody said they like the text charting activity. Uh, you could read this, you could add this to your read aloud and make it, um, make it interactive, that's great. Stop and draw, you could use this during guided reading. Stop and draw can also be used during, if you're showing a video as well, to make sure that the kids are, um, are listening. Thank you, somebody said yes, the objectives are met. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. The PowerPoint will be shared after the webinar. Um, 
I'm a principal and I would love to use this with my staff, a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. It's always nice to have an administrator participate. So it's such a great way to support your teachers. Uh, somebody gives here a website for the Kagan structures for ELL, an article. This too will be added um, when we share the PowerPoint. Once again, we apologize for the um, for the sound problems. It was really nice to have you with us. And this was asked last time, um, who do I email to get a certificate for this training? So I'm going to turn the headphones back to Lindsay, and she can address all of these. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Anne. We appreciate it and love hearing from you. And based on all of your expertise. So a couple of logistical questions here that folks have. With regards to the presentation itself, it's available on Education Connections. Um, it is a site that is a group of teachers. Um, there are lots of resources. All of our webinars are there. So you do need to create a login. It's edconnect, um, obiverse.net slash edconnect. Um, we can post that um, and we'll show you that again. If you don't want to join the site and want the presentation another way, we can work with you to do that. Just email us at edconnect at cal.org. With regards to the certificate question, we typically don't create certificates. Um, in some cases in the past, if someone wanted something to share with their uh, administrator to show that they had participated, we could um, do what you need to get that done. We, we've sent emails or whatever you need us to do, just communicate with us and we'll see if we can get you what you need to certify that you were, um, you did attend this session. So just email us at connect at cal.org um, for that information. Um, we're so, so excited to see that a number of you are hoping to share these ideas with your colleagues, that's really, really exciting for us. Um, we love that you're here and we love that these ideas will also be shared with others. So we hope it does help you and your colleagues to um, add to what whatever you're doing now to even better support newcomer students this coming school year. Um, so I'll just send a final thank you out to Anne. Uh, we love hearing from you, Anne, and we hope everyone has found it helpful. Thank you so much for spending time with us. We know you're in the middle of summer, and we really appreciate you taking some time out of your summer to be here with us. Uh, we know that that is you going above and beyond, and we applaud all of the work that you all do. Um, every day for your students. Uh, we wanted to let you know that the Center for Applied Linguistics is hosting an institute in Washington, D.C. about newcomer students on August 8th to 9th. Um, so if you are interested in that, you can go to cal.org, C-A-L dot O-R-G for more information. Um, if you want, you can also email us at connect at cal.org. Our team, the Education Connections team, is not putting that on, but we'd be happy to connect you with the right folks about that opportunity. Um, one final invitation, if you want to keep chatting with us, there's a bunch of you that are on Twitter. Um, follow us at edconnectcal, and the hashtag is E-D-C-O-N-X again. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Have a great day.